Wonderful, mighty God. And oh, Lord, we just thank you that we're still able to uh, proclaim your word, Lord. We thank you that people are able to tune in, Lord, and hear your word, Father. We pray, Lord, that you'd touch hearts this morning. And we pray, Lord, that uh, your word would sink in deep, Lord, and we'd grow in our knowledge and our understanding of you. And we ask these things through your son, Jesus. Amen. So this morning we're in uh, 1 John chapter 1. Now, 1 John was written by the Apostle John, and at this time in his life, that when John wrote this, he's an old man, uh, probably close to 90 years old. And according to a tradition, all the other apostles are dead. They've been put to death for their proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, John's probably wondering why he's still alive. Uh, I'm sure more than once that John remembered back to the time, 60 years ago, when Christ rose from the dead. In fact, if you think about it, 60 years is a long time. If I think back 60 years ago, it would be 1960. I would have been four years old. And a lot has happened in the last 60 years here in the United States, you know. And uh, so John remembers back 60 years ago when Christ had risen from the dead. And Christ told him that he was going to meet them in Galilee. So they were hanging out at the Sea of Galilee and, and Christ showed up. And I'm sure you remember the story how Christ restored Peter. Peter, do you love me? And then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? And uh, he restored Peter. But Christ also at this time, he told Peter of how he would die. We see that in John 21, 9. It said, this he spoke, signifying by what death he, that would be Peter, would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. See, what Jesus is telling Peter is how you die is not important. It's how you live that's important. And, Peter, and Jesus tells Peter to follow me. Now, John was listening to what was taking place between Peter and Jesus. And Peter, he saw John standing there listening to them. And Peter asked Jesus. He says in John 21, 21, Peter, seeing him, seeing John, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? In other words, Jesus, what about John? How is he going to die? Is he going to suffer too? John 21, 22, it says, Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. See, Jesus tells John, uh, Peter, what I have in store for John is none of your business, Peter. If he lives until I return again to set up my throne on earth, what is that to you? You just worry about one thing, Peter. Follow me. But you know what? Because of how Jesus answered Peter, the rumor started flying. You know, um, did you hear what Jesus said? He said John wasn't going to die. He said John that was going to remain until he returned and set up his kingdom. And John talks about this in John 21, 23. It said, then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple, this John, would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but he said, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? Now, John, along with Peter and James, he had a special relationship with Jesus. Jesus seemed to like to hang out with them. He liked to include them in his exploits. And, and uh, he included them when he went up to the, the Mount of Transfiguration. He brought along Peter, James, and John. When he went to raise the little girl Talitha from the dead, he brought along Peter, James, and John. And John refers to himself, and Jesus had a, he, him and Jesus had a special relationship. John refers to himself five times in the Gospel of John as the disciple whom Jesus loved. John would never use his own name, but that's how, what he referred to himself as. And here it is 60 years later, there's no more Peter, there's no more James. And even Paul, the last apostle chosen by Jesus to help spread the Gospel throughout the world, He's gone. See, they've all been put to death by the Romans. And the world is a different place. I just mentioned how it's so crazy here in the U.S. how things have changed in the last 60 years. It was the same for John. See, things changed. The temple had been destroyed by the Romans. Jerusalem lies in ruins. The Jews have been scattered. Many have been sold into slavery. And over a million Jews have been killed by the Romans. And also, Christians, followers of Christ, have also become a target of the Romans. Yet, despite the persecutions, despite being scorned by the world, the gospel has spread throughout the nations bordering the Mediterranean Sea. Thousands have become followers of Christ, and the Apostle John had a lot to do with that. See, along with the other ten apostles, he was commissioned by Christ, and we see that in Matthew 28, 19, 20, and Christ told them, go and make disciples of all the nations, 
Christ told them to baptize them and to teach them to observe all things that he has commanded you. And 60 years later, John was still continuing in the ministry Christ had called him to do. In fact, he had written his gospel already, the book of John. And it may be the only book in the Bible where the author clearly states his purpose for writing it. John says that this gospel was written so that the reader would understand who Jesus Christ is and that the reader's understanding of the word would lead them to having a relationship with Christ. We see that in John 20, 31. He said, but these, these words are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And John, he makes his intentions clear from the get-go in his gospel. He begins his gospel speaking of Jesus Christ, and we see that in John 1.1. 1, 1. He said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. See, there's no beating around the bush with John. Just very simple, very straightforward. There's no compound or complex sentence structure. Nothing you can take and twist. He says, Jesus, the Word was there in the beginning, that he was with God, he was with his Father, he was with the Holy Spirit, and he was God. And not only that, John clearly states that Jesus was the creator of all things. We see that in John chapter 1, verse 2. He says, He, Jesus, was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And those were the first words that John writes in the Bible. And he says, Jesus, the creator of all things, is God. The most important thing John wants you to understand is who Jesus Christ is. And not only that, John continues to make it clear in his gospel that the Son of God came down and dwelt on this earth as a man. And that John himself witnessed it. We see that in John 1.14. He said, And the Word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the gospel, the good news, who Jesus Christ was, and the hope of eternal life that he brought was made crystal clear, not just in the Gospel of John, but also in the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark and Luke. It was made clear in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. It was made clear in the letters written by, John, by Paul and Peter. See, God's gift to mankind was presented plainly. And back when John was younger, his biggest worry as an apostle was that the Judaizers would claim that in order to be a follower of Christ, the Gentile believer had to become a Jew that the Gentile believer had to be circumcised, that he had to follow the law of Moses, that they had to attend the festivals. But John, along with Peter and Paul and others led by the Holy Spirit, they made it clear that all you needed to become a follower of Christ was to believe in him. If you're watching this this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ and you would like to become a follower, we'll give you an opportunity. But then the church, after that, they come under persecution. The Jews, the Sanhedrin, the priests, the elders, they come against the followers of Christ. They called them blasphemers. They had put them, had them thrown in prison, and they had put some to death. But the gospel still spread. Then the Romans persecuted the followers of Christ. But still, Christianity spread. And John had seen it all. But you know, the biggest threat against the church was just beginning. See, the enemy walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he can destroy. And he's very good at what he does. And the enemy thinks, well, if you can't beat him, join him. So the enemy uses false teachers on the inside of the church to pollute the gospel, to proclaim, proclaim a different Christ, to try and get the believer to take their eyes off of who Jesus Christ is. And the new false teaching that's getting everyone's attention at this time in John's life is Gnosticism. See, Gnostics, they claim to follow the teaching of Jesus Christ, but Gnosticism is based on three false premises. The first is that the belief of all things material, whether it's people, whether it's creation, money, all matter on the earth is evil. And, but they say everything of the spirit is good. Thus, according to Gnosticism, you can be involved in any works of the flesh, no matter how vile, and it has no bearing on your spiritual life. See, because all material things are evil, and they can't be avoided. So it doesn't really matter what you do in your material life. What's important is your spiritual being. Now you can see how this would conflict with the teaching of Jesus Christ. But these Gnostics, they claim to possess a higher knowledge. In fact, the word Gnostics comes from the Greek word Gnosis, and it means to know. We get a word to know from it. 
And they thought this higher knowledge came from some mystical higher plane of existence. And that leads us to the second false premise. To a Gnostic, salvation was obtained through this divine knowledge, which was imparted upon them, and it would free them from the illusions of darkness. And even though they claimed to be followers of Christ, this divine knowledge had nothing to do with the word of God. And the third false premise of Gnosticism, see, they taught a different Jesus Christ. See, they believed that Jesus Christ couldn't be a human, right? Because all physical matter on the earth was evil. Therefore, Jesus couldn't be a human because all humans are evil physically. So he had to be just a spiritual being. So what they believed was, for example, when, Christ, when John, uh, Jesus came down to be baptized, that Christ, the spirit of Christ, came upon him. And it lived in his body for those three years, right up until the time just before he was crucified, and the Spirit of Christ left him. Well, that causes some problems if you're a Christian and what the Bible says. That means that there would be no virgin birth. That means that Jesus wouldn't have experienced the struggles of mankind. That means that Jesus wouldn't have suffered on a cross, that he would not have become the perfect sacrifice, that he wouldn't have paid the price for the sins of man. And yet the Gnostics say they're followers of Christ. And Gnosticism was growing, and it was turning people away from having a real relationship with Christ. So John, the last of the living who had walked with Christ, the last of the apostles who was appointed by Christ to spread the gospel, the last remaining original leader of the church, he writes a letter to the churches. And I'm sure it was sent to the seven churches in Revelation, along with all the other churches that had been established. And he writes a letter to them refuting this false teaching that had made its way into the church. That was causing people to take their eyes off of who Jesus Christ was. And caused them to disregard his teachings. And, and he sent this letter to encourage the people to turn back to the word of God. And that's where we're going to start this morning. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. John says, That which was from the beginning, and he's speaking of Jesus Christ, which we have heard, which we have seen, with our eyes, which we have looked upon and with our hands have handled, concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, which we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and we have heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with Father, the Father and the, his Son, Jesus Christ. See, John makes it clear from the start of his letter that he walked with Christ. He had seen him with his own eyes. In fact, he mentions it three times in his opening sentence. He's saying that he heard the words of Christ. He's saying, I'm telling you plainly, not as leader of the church, but as an apostle, as one who accompanied Jesus for three years, as one who had seen him face to face, as one who had spoke to him, as one who had listened to him, as one who had hung out with him, that this Jesus Christ, this Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the word of life. He's the one that the Father manifested to us. He's the one that he sent to mankind, fully human. He says, I know I touched him. I've handled him. I know I was there, John is saying. Luke said in Luke 24, 39, back when Jesus rose from the dead, the apostles weren't quite sure what to do. And at one time they were hanging out in a room and all of a sudden Jesus just appears to them in the middle of the room and they start freaking out. Some of them think that he's a ghost. Some of them think that he's a spirit. But Jesus said in Luke 24, 39, he said, Behold my hands and my feet. Look at my hands and my feet. Look at the scars, guys. He said that it is I myself. He said, Handle me and see. Come and grab hold, guys. Fill, fill my flesh. Fill my flesh, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. See, John wants the church to understand that the wolves are out. And if you're not careful, if you take your eyes off the word of God, you can be led astray. See, and Paul warned about this in his second letter to the Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 11, 4, Paul said, For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which we have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Paul's telling them, if you're not familiar with the word of God, you can be duped. You can be deceived. You just may receive another Jesus, a different gospel, instead of the real thing. Hey, you hear teachers today. You hear te It sounds good to me. You like what they're saying. Man, it sounds like they're right on. They're very intelligent. And, 
you know, it just, it just sounds so good. Make sure they're teaching the word of God. Matthew tells us that even those who have a relationship with Christ can be drawn away if they're not careful to keep their eyes upon Christ. In Matthew 24, 24, he says, For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, there's a reason that John starts this letter to the churches by clarifying who Jesus Christ is. The most important thing that defines your belief in God is your determination who Jesus Christ is. How do you know who he is? If you want to know who Jesus Christ is, guys, read the book. Read the Bible. It's a book authored by the Holy Spirit. It's a book about Jesus Christ. Everything in it is about Jesus Christ. Everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. Everything in the New Testament reveals Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus Christ is the Word of God. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Jesus said in John 5.39, He says, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But then Jesus said, And these, these scriptures, are they which testify of me. The Bible is about Jesus Christ. The same Jesus Christ who led Israel from captivity into the promised land in the Old Testament is the same Jesus Christ who leads us from the captivity of sin and into eternal life. See, here at Calvary Chapel, we have what's called a mission statement, who we believe Jesus Christ is. And it's all from the Word of God. Here at Calvary Chapel, we believe that Jesus Christ is fully God. He's the Son of God. He's part of the triune God. He's Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? We believe that he became a man through a virgin birth by the power of the Holy Spirit. We believed he lived a sinless life. We believed he performed miracles on this earth and that he is the Word of God. We believe that he died on a cross, that he's the perfect sacrifice to cover the sins of mankind. We believe that he rose from the dead and that he ascended into heaven. And we also believe that belief in him is the only way to obtain salvation, the only way to obtain eternal life. John 4, 16 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes through the Father through me. We also believe that he's coming back to rule and reign on this earth. And we believe these things because you find them in the word of God. If you want to go check out all the, 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 the scriptures and the verses, go to Calvary Chapel webpage. Go to the top and look at what we believe. And guys, we believe these things because that's what the Word of God teaches. See, the difference between Calvary Chapel Gridley and the Mormon church is that we serve a different Jesus Christ. The difference between Calvary Chapel Gridley and the Jehovah's Witnesses or between Calvary Chapel Gridley and the New Age Church or the Catholic Church or the Church of Scientology is that we serve a different Jesus Christ than the one they claim to follow. And John's warning to the early church is also a warning for that we need to heed today because Gnosticism is still being taught. It's now called the New Age Movement. And the teaching of a different Christ is alive more today than ever. See, none of the churches I mentioned earlier believe, or they don't. Neither, none of them follow the Christ of the Bible I just outlined. These churches will tell you that Christ is the brother of Lucifer, the brother of Satan, or that he's an angelic being, or that he's Michael the archangel, that he's not deity, that he was once a man just like you and that he earned his position as son of God by his works, or that their Jesus, that the, their Jesus' work on the cross wasn't enough to cover all your sins, that you still have to pay a physical price, or that he was just a great spiritual leader, or that the New Ages, they still tell you that he's just a spirit and he never was a physical man. And you might think I would never fall for something like that, but you know what? If you take your eyes off the Word of God, the chances are that you will get off track. Paul said even the elect can be deceived. And he states that, Paul stated that there will be a falling away of the church in the end times. And 1 Timothy 4.1 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And you think, well, how does that come about? Well, it comes about by people taking their eyes off of Jesus Christ by neglecting his word. And John ends the first sentence in verse 3 of his letter by encouraging us 
by giving us the result of us realizing that Jesus Christ is the word of life, that Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God, which results, John says, in fellowship. Fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. John says that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, speaking of Jesus Christ, that which we have seen and heard and declare to you, and why do we declare it to you? That also you may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And John's going to spend some time in instructing the body on how to have fellowship with God, how to walk with God, how to grow in your walk with the Lord. In verse 4 he says, And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. See, John understands that true joy is based on your relationship with Jesus Christ. The word joy in Greek means cheerfulness, calm delight, gladness, exceedingly joyful. And John, who has experienced a close personal relationship with Christ, both physically and spiritually, informs us that pure joy only comes from being one with God, from having the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, and from, from keeping your eyes upon Christ in all things. Psalm 1611, speaking of God, says, uh, You will show me the path of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures evermore. At the right hand of God is his Son, Jesus Christ. And this joy is only available if we follow the path of life that God puts at our feet, if we are led by the Holy Spirit. Romans fourteen seventeen says, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's interesting in his letter to the churches when John finishes his proclamation of who Jesus Christ is, you would think that first thing he would encourage the body to do is to love one another or to spend more time in prayer or to spend more time in the word or to be bold for the Lord. And while all these things are uplifting and they're well worth doing, the first topic that John brings up in verse 5 is sin. And just as Jesus did, John uses the words light and darkness as metaphors for righteousness and sin. Verse 5, John says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. See, the business, biggest thing that causes your walk with the Lord to suffer is sin. It always has been and it always will be. See, God is a righteous God, and he takes sin seriously. And John gives us two choices of the type of follower in Christ that we are. He says, if we say we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. See, if we say we have fellowship with God, and when he says and walk in darkness, that means we walk in sin. That doesn't mean we, you know, we all sin occasionally, but that means if we live a lifestyle of sin, if we live a lifestyle of repetitive sin, and we say that we follow Jesus Christ, guys, we're about liars. John says we're liars. But he also says if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, note the result of walking in the light, of walking in the way of Jesus Christ. We have fellowship with one another. We'll get more on that in a little bit. But then John gives us two more categories to define what kind of believer we are. In verse 8, he says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he... God is faithful to be and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. John says if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Guys, everybody sins. Everybody. You show me someone who says that they don't sin and I'll show you a liar. Liar, liar, liar. See, not only that, but verse 10 says that if we say we have not sinned, then we also make God a liar and that his word is not in us. See, those who claim they don't sin not only make themselves a liar, they're calling God a liar and his word is not in them. And who is the word? Jesus Christ. See, there's some serious allegations going on here. And I'm going to say something that will probably shock most of you. Guys, I'm a sinner. I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. Which really makes me happy 
that John includes group B here. Because in group B, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God. What a huge verse. I, I underline, underline that in your Bible. That's a huge verse in your walk with the Lord. See, there's no sin that you have committed that is so vile that the blood of Jesus Christ won't cover it. But there's something I want to point out here. Jesus Christ died on the cross to cover every sin that's been committed. And that is true, past, present, and future. And if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, all of your sins have been paid for. But that doesn't mean you have a free reign to sin and just blow it off because it's been forgiven. John says that Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, but there's an if involved in the transaction. See, there's an action that needs to be taken by the sinner, and that is if we confess our sins. The Greek word confess means to acknowledge. If we acknowledge our sins before God, then he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Guys, if we don't confess our sins before God, you're still hanging on to them. Chapter 2. And in chapter 2, John continues writing about sin. He says in verse 1, My little children, these things are right to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. See, John can and tries to encourage the body of believers to avoid sin. He says, my little children, I write to you so that you may not sin. He's doing the same thing the other apostles did, just as the word encourages us to flee from sexual sin, to flee from idolatry, to flee from the desires of the flesh. But John knows that we are human, and he knows that we are going to stumble. So John reminds us that when we do sin, we all have that advocate, that defense attorney, that intercedes in our behalf before the Father. And John uses the term advocate to describe Christ. And he also uses it to give the appearance of a courtroom setting. And I can just imagine myself on one side of the court before God, we have the accuser, Satan, who's quick to reveal our sins before the Father. And I can just see Satan saying, Lord, this Paul here, he's a scumbag. He sinned again. He's did it again, the same sin that he's done over and over and over. And you know what you said? You said that sin is deserving of death. And you think, well, does that really happen? Revelation 12.10 says, For the accuser of our brethren, which is Satan, who accused them before our God day and night. Until Satan's cast totally, completely out of heaven, he's before God accusing us of our sins day and night. But you know what's interesting? On the other side of the courtroom, we're standing there before God, knowing full well that we're guilty of the accusations from Satan. And yet our advocate... We have the advocate says, objection, your honor, objection. The charges are irrelevant. See, these sins have already been paid for. Why are we even here? My client is not guilty, your honor. My client is as white as snow. You know, to think that I'm as white as snow is crazy talk. But that's what God does. And that's what John is encouraging his readers to do, to confess your sins, to acknowledge them, and to give them to your advocate. Give them to Jesus Christ, and then just continue walking with the Lord. And the next issue John brings up is, how do you know if you are where you should be in your relationship with God? I'm sure we all have those thoughts. You know, how do I know if I'm growing in my walk with the Lord? How do I know if I'm doing the right thing? And John, he clearly told us who Jesus Christ is, but the question is, what makes you a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, John tells us in verse 3, he says, Now by this, that we know him, well, now by this, we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. See, Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. And these are not just obscure verses about obeying God. You, you don't, these aren't hit verses that are just hidden in the Bible, see? God defining our love for him by finding out whether or not we will obey him is found throughout the Bible. We see it at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis. At the creation, God created the heavens and the earth and they were amazing. God created the whole earth and he created Adam and he created Eve and he gave the earth to Adam and Eve. And he tells Adam and, Adam and Eve, hey, this is all yours. This is all yours, guys. 
You know, you have dominion over the earth. You are the rulers of this earth. It is all yours. Just one thing. Just one thing. You see that tree over there? That one over there by the snake? Don't eat of the fruit of that tree, okay? That's it. Because if you eat of the fruit of that tree, you lose it all. You guys know the story. We live in a lost world. You know, I don't think God was feeling a whole lot of love from Adam and Eve at that time. But God didn't just stop there. We see God offering a special blessing up on Moses and the Israelites. He offers them a covenant based on their obedience to God and keeping his word. God speaking to Moses in Exodus 19.5 says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And you know what? Forty years later, we find out that it didn't work out too well for Moses and the Israelites who had escaped from Egypt. Yet, God offers the same covenant to Joshua and the next generation of Israelites. We see in Deuteronomy 28.1, it says, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. And there's verse after verse after verse of blessings that come with it. And they all, they all agreed. They all give him the mouth action he wanted to hear. Yes, we agreed. See, they said they loved him with their mouths but their hearts were drawn away by idolatry, and they lost the promise. We see God also making promises with Solomon, with Jeroboam, same kind of promises to obey and follow his word with great blessings to follow, and they also failed. See, the biggest problem with all these covenants between man and God wasn't that by failing to obey the covenant they had made with God that man missed out on these amazing blessings of God which was huge, and it was a tragedy. But the biggest problem was that each one of these covenants contained an if-you-do-not-obey clause that contained a significant penalty, a curse, if you will, for failing to uphold their end of the covenant. Thomas Jefferson once said, with great risk comes great reward. But when you're dealing with God, the risk is devastating. I don't know if the risk outweighs the rewards, because the rewards are amazing, but the risk of disobedience to God is devastating. And as we get to the New Testament, we continue to find the concept of man's obedience to God to determine man's love for God. It's still in effect. We just read where Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. John 14, 24 says, he who does not love me does not keep my words. John 14, 23, says, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Do you see the reward there? Note that the reward for obeying Christ is still there. See, if we obey God, if we keep his word, we have eternal fellowship with God. See, this new covenant with God is offered to every single man and woman. But keep in mind, the risks are still devastating. Failure to obey and follow the word of God ends in eternal damnation for everyone. See, it's all just a question of love. If you love me, you'll obey me, God says. Obeying God not only brings about eternal blessing, but it also brings blessings that we need here on this earth. Do you want the Holy Spirit to lead and direct and guide your life? Then obey God, follow his word. Acts 5.32 says, And we are his witnesses to these things, And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Do you want to make sure you're a child of God? Romans 18, 14 says, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Do you want joy in your life? John 15, 10, 11 says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Do you want to have a close relationship with God? You know what? I've heard people tell me before. It seems like God is just so far away. You know, I'm, I I'm just not, don't feel like I'm close to God anymore. I just don't feel his presence in my life. Well, do you want to have a close relationship with God? John 14, 21 says, 
He who has my commandments and keeps them. Now, I want to clarify what I just said. He who has my commandments and keep, keeps them means he who has a Bible who reads it and does what God tells him to do. Okay. It is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. The word manifest means reveal. If you want God to reveal himself to you, keep his commandments. Read his word. See, man was created to have a relationship with God. We have built in each one of us an inclination, a propensity to follow God. And just because man may choose not to follow God, that doesn't mean that the inclination has gone away. What we do is we replace God with things of the world. That's why you see so many followers, people involved in crazy religions and cults and gangs and radical groups flourish. See, people are filling a void. And most people have no idea why they are following that which they choose to follow. You may be watching this message and maybe you don't have a relationship with God. And you may be saying to yourself, I'm not following anyone. I'll make my own pathway through life. Okay, so that's what I did. That's what I did. My mom went to church all the time. But you know what? I, I, before I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, I didn't want anything to do with Satan. I mean, I wouldn't even watch The Exorcist. I didn't want to mess around with the Ouija board. That kind of stuff scared me. I, I wasn't going to serve Satan. But you know what? I didn't want to be no Jesus freak either. So I was going to make my own path. I wasn't going to serve anybody. But you know, back in 1979, for those of you who are as old as I am and can remember Bob Dylan, he was a prolific songwriter, not much of a singer. But you know, back when I was young in 1979, he put out a gospel album. And the single he released from the album was, You've Got to Serve Somebody. And the words where he said, you got to serve somebody. He said, it may be the devil, and it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. You know, that's just, that's just what he did. I'm sorry about that. But he was right. You're going to have to serve somebody. And I don't know if I agreed with it, but at that time I was playing in a band. And, and a friend of mine, a drummer named Randy, a really good friend, he, we used to talk about God. And he came up with me, and we were talking one time. He says, you know we're serving the devil. I said, you know, you might be serving the devil, but I'm not serving the devil. And he says, but we are. I said, what do you mean? He said, look around. He says, we go, we went and played at nightclubs and in bars. He said, you go and play in the bars. Look around what's happening. People getting drunk, people doing things they shouldn't be doing. He said, we're just a tool for the devil. And you know what? He was right. It wasn't long after that I didn't play in a band anymore. But you don't have to take my word for it. Listen to what the Bible says about it. S serving someone. Romans 6.16 says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey? You are that one's slaves. Whom you obey, whether of sin, leading to death, or of obedience, leading to righteousness. See, another definition of sin is disobedience to the word of God. And sin always leads to bondage. You become a slave to it. And it always leads to death. But he goes on in Romans 6, 17, he says, But God, be think that you, though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which you were delivered. The writer saying, hey, we delivered the gospel to you. You heard it and you believed and obeyed the word of God. And the result was, and you having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So you're going to have to serve somebody. See, obedience to the word of God always sets you free from bondage of sin. And it leads to eternal life. But either way, whether you disobey or ignore the word of God, or whether you choose to obey the word of God, you're still serving somebody. It's just a choice that you make of whom you serve. I like what D.L. Moody said. His quote was, there will be no peace in any soul until it is able to obey the voice of God. And you might think, well, what if I follow most of Christ's teachings, but I choose to ignore other ones? Maybe you're someone who claims to be walking with God. Maybe you say that you're a follower of Christ. But instead of buying into the whole Bible, you want to pick and choose those things to believe in. You know, I, I loving one another, that's just great stuff. I believe in that. And, uh, you know, helping the needy, that's good. I believe in that. But sexual sin, you know what? Everybody's doing it, you know? That's just the way things are. And homosexuality, that's just accepted by everyone. I, I I'm not going to judge it. I'm going to let those things go. I don't want to be a prude. 
But John addresses this in verse 4. He says, He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So, how much of the teachings of Christ do you have to accept? How much do the teachings of Christ do you have to keep and in order to be able to keep your status as a follower of Christ? The answer is all of them. Numbers 15.40 says, And that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy for your God. 1 Peter 1.15.16 says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Romans 12.2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. John says, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Guys, that's heavy. That spoke to me. You know, there's some areas in my life that I, I you know, I, am I really doing what God wants me to do? Am I living this lifestyle of sin that I shouldn't be living in? Is this speaking to me? Lord, take these areas of my life. Lord, help me to keep your commandments. Because he says, if you say, I know him, and you don't, you're a liar. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who abides, says he abides in him, ought himself to walk just as he walked. See, Jesus Christ is our example. If we want to know how to walk with God, pick up your Bible, read about Jesus Christ, and it's all about Jesus Christ, and keep his word. And you'll be walking with God. James 1.22 says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. See, James tell us, tells us that we need to be doers of the word, to do the things that the word of God tells us to do. It's not good enough just to hear the word of God. It's not good enough just to come to church every Sunday and listen to Brad's message and don't do anything about it. James says that if you hear the word and you don't do the word, you may think you're a follower of Christ, but you're just deceiving yourself. Verse 7, John says, Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. See, John's writing here seems kind of confusing. He starts with, out with, I write no new commandment to you. And then he seems to radiate, radiate, he reiterate that thought. And then in verse 8, he says, oh, a new commandment I write to you. Make up your mind, John. Which one is it? Is it an old one or is it a new one? Well, really, it's both. Let me explain. At the beginning of this passage, John is being kind of cryptic. When John says, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have from the beginning, he defines what he's talking about in a cryptic sort of way. He says, the old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning, and there lies the clue. That's the key to what John is saying. John calls this old commandment the word from the beginning. If you're familiar with John's gospel that he had already written, as stated earlier, that I read earlier, he began it with John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So what John is saying is that this old commandment he refers to as the Word in the beginning is Jesus Christ. So when John continues and says in verse 8, again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The new commandment he's referring to is the one from Jesus Christ that John had written about in his gospel, which ties these two verses together. Back in John 13, 34, Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. See, Jesus condenses all of his commandments into one single commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. And if we can do that, then all will know that you are my disciples, Jesus says, because of the love you have for one another. 
And you might think, is it really all we need to do in order to follow Christ? Is just one love one another as Christ loved us? Absolutely. Because if we really loved one another like Christ loved us, we would always be kind to one another. We would always bless one another. We would always pray for one another. We would always help one another. We would encourage one another. We would do unto others as we would have them do unto us. We would never sin against our brothers and sisters. We would never encourage them to sin or to cause them to disobey what Jesus has commanded, commanded to cause their walk with God to suffer. We would meet the needs of one another. We would go to the extreme just so someone could come to have a walk with God. We would even die upon a cross for them. If we truly loved one another like Christ loved us, we would obey every commandment in the word of God. And there'd be no need for the Ten Commandments, no need for the law. And that brings us back to the last point I want to make today. Back in chapter 1, we read in, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Guys, anytime you go to a church where a body of believers are following and are obeying the word of God, it ends in fellowship with one another. I've heard many people say that the unique thing about this body here is the visible love for one another. They'll come into this church and they'll see people hugging one another and caring about one another and loving one another and it blows them away. And I think that's the result of being part of a church that teaches the word of God and encourages the body to obey and follow the word of God. We just read Jesus' new commandment for his followers, that we love one another as Christ has loved us. But I want to read the next verse that Jesus says right after that to give his summary of what loving one another does. John 13, 35 says, By all this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Guys, this church here at Calvary Chapel has been and continues to be a light for Gridley in the surrounding area. We have reflected Jesus Christ to a dark world. We teach the full counsel of God, verse by book, verse, book by book. But as I look out here today, I see an empty building. And I recognize it for what it is. It is an attack from the enemy. The enemy doesn't want us to come together and have fellowship with one another. He doesn't want us to come together and, and worship our Lord. He doesn't want us to come together and hear the word of God. But you know what? We need more than ever now to draw close to the Lord as a body. We need more than ever to be strong in our walk with the Lord. To be diligent to read his word. To be diligent to stay in prayer. We need to reflect Jesus Christ to a dark, dark world. We need more than ever to love one another, to reach out and bless one another, to pray for one another. Guys, I encourage you this morning, pray for Brad. Lift him up. He's under a lot of attack. He's having to make decisions that he never even dreamed he would have to make. Pray that the Holy Spirit would lead and direct and guide him that he would strengthen him, that he would bless his marriage, that he would bless his family. Lift Brad up. Pray for this church. Pray for this body. Pray for one another. You know what? And don't stop there. Guys, we need to pray for our governors. We need to pray for the president. We need to pray for this nation, guys. Things are changing quick. But I can't help but think back to what God told Solomon in Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. That verse is for us too, guys. We are the people of God and if we will humble ourselves and we will pray and we will truly seek God's face and if we turn from our wicked ways, if we obey his word, Maybe God will hear from heaven. And maybe he, I know he'll forgive our sin, but maybe he'll heal our land. Guys, you never know. You never know. But it's the time for us to, to spend time on our knees before the Lord. And you know what? 
And if it is the time for this, nations don't last forever. I understand that. If it's a time for this United States of America to go down, guys, let's go down with our light shining brightly and win as many as we can into the kingdom before it all takes place. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are a wonderful and mighty God, Lord. Uh, we just thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your word for us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we're still allowed to come here and teach your word, Lord. We pray that you would move mightily, Lord. I look forward to seeing my brothers and sisters in this building here again, Father. Lord, I, I, I just want to lift up everyone, Lord. You know everyone's needs, Father. I pray for those who are hurting and who are sick. Lord, I pray for a healing touch. Lord, but I pray your will be done, that you would strengthen, that you would bless, that you would encourage. I pray for those that are hurting, Lord, that you would restore joy, Father. I pray for those that have needs, Father, whether they be physical needs or financial needs or personal needs, Lord. You're the answer, Father. I pray that you'd give us peace, you'd give us joy, Lord, and that we would trust in you, Lord, and that you would move mightily on our behalf. I pray that we would love one another, Father. I pray that we'd reach out and encourage one another, Lord. I pray that we would grow in you. I want to thank you for this body, Lord. And if there's anyone watching this, message and you don't know jesus christ and you want to have that assurance of eternal life and you want to have the holy spirit in your heart and leading and directing and guiding you i pray right now it's real simple guys all you have to do is jesus i believe you are this say this jesus i believe you are the son of god i ask you to forgive me of my sins and i accept you as my savior it's that easy guys that's the difference between eternal life and eternal damnation I encourage you to do that this morning. God bless all of you and have a great day. And you know what, guys? If you have the time, go up to the family camp and have a fun time with Brad. Amen.